Okay, welcome everybody to the panel discussion here in the publishers uh, section of WordCamp CT. Uh, with me over here, I have got Joe Buerta, Carl Norman, Shaul, I beg your pardon, Shaul Norman, <laughs> Mark uh, Peril, and uh, Neil Percy. There we go. My eyes are not with me today. Um, we're going to be chatting a bit about uh, the future of WordPress publishing. Uh, but to get us starting, why don't you just give us a quick introduction about who you are and uh, how you got into WordPress. Cool, thanks. So, yeah, it's fine. Um, so my name is Joe. Um, I guess I, I was pretty against blogging around about 2006. I thought it was a big waste of time. And then I went to a geek dinner and um, people said, well, let's try it. And I um, went to WordPress that evening. And that's it. So I've been using... Um, well, I blog personally, I've got a photo blog, and I, um, I've got a company blog. Okay. <coughs> um, I, and blogging's not really obviously a full-time thing, I mainly built a few social networks, that was, um, uh, South African focused social networks, and Media24 acquired it a few years ago, and I've done a lot of work for them, and uh, at the same time I also ran a blog network, so I don't blog as much myself, I mean, as I'm sure most of you would agree, like, it's tough to find time to blog all the time, so, for running a blog network and hiring writers, and I have a few blogs which um, I'll hope to share some insight today in terms of uh, managing the blog network. Um, I, yeah, I blank. Um, before 2008, I was like Joe, also didn't really believe in blogging. Um, then my brother and I started a blog called Moon of Freelancers, which um, gained a lot of traction and brought us a lot of business. So we moved that into a video blog called From the Couch, which um, got about a thousand visitors a day at one stage. And um, yeah, that moved us into, into WordPress and creating WordPress themes. So I have experience in blogging myself and also in um, basically making blogs for users. And yeah, that's about it. How's it, Neil? Um, basically, in 2003, I was, uh, had a real estate company and couldn't get any, any traffic to my website and was looking into different CMSs that we could use. And uh, WordPress was the one that stood out. It was the number one, and ever since then, uh, yeah, I've been a big WordPress fan. Fantastic. Now, uh, what drew you to WordPress as a publishing platform? Uh, and WordPress versus other CMS for blogging? Well, WordPress stands out as to be the easiest uh, around in terms of management, uh, in my mind. And uh, in 2006, we moved, to, in, we moved into WordPress. So for me, that was, that was key, just the simplicity of it. Um, I think that WordPress is definitely the best uh, platform if you want to expand your blog and uh, you know you can use things like plugins and um, and custom themes to get it like looking really good and to function um, in a in a more personal way um, there are other platforms which are cool for people who want to do casual blogging like uh, like Tumblr and Postgres where it's not so it's not as technical but um, it's quite easy to use so I'm just going to be the devil's advocate and say WordPress is not the only thing to use. There are other platforms which are, which are really cool to use. I mean, it's pretty tough to give a cool answer here and teach the audience something when you guys have been here all day learning about all the different things you know, in terms of WordPress. So you're all experts might know, but I mean, WordPress is blogging definitely the leading platform, and it's because of the ecosystem that's around WordPress, the theming ecosystem. I mean, there's like trillions of themes that you can install to you know kit out your um, blog, and there's this premium theme market that has evolved over the last few years that you can get themes to with one click build um, job boards or you know real estate uh, websites etc just with a theme so uh, and there's a great plugin ecosystem around it as well um, you know blogging aside WordPress has evolved into like the number one CMS in my opinion and sure there are advocates for Drupal and the Joomla's etc out there as well but in terms of you know the community around WordPress and how it's evolving all the time in terms of security and plugins and you know theming. I mean, it's by far, in my opinion, the best CMS to it. Um, I'd say that um, WordPress drew my attention because of the ethos behind it first. Um, I'm a big open source geek at the time, still am, and yeah, so the open source um, angle to it and sort of the um, 
the openness and the ability to extend it and to look under the hood and to tinker with it was definitely one of the big things. Um, and then secondly, I've been in a few scenarios where um, I'd had to sort of delegate the task of maintaining something. And it's definitely the most accessible option out there, I think, in terms of getting people up to speed. It's not intimidating. Um, it's sort of easy. People don't resist it. I've had the displeasure of having people navigate ugly sort of menu structures of all the other CMSs and give me blank stares. And I think just sort of the, the ability to get people up to speed with WordPress is definitely the winner. Now, uh, we go into video blogging. Um, Mark, you're a bit of an expert in this. Um, how does video blogging fit into your overall strategy? Um, well, we don't actually do much video blogging anymore, but <laughs> our video blog had its last post in 2009. Rest in peace. Rest in peace, that's true. But um, as, in terms of the strategy, it was our only strategy, and it was our only way to educate our our audience as to what we did. I mean, you may think that if you're doing something um, relatively elementary in your view, uh, put on a video blog and there'll be a thousand or two thousand people who think that you're doing something that's quite unique. And um, as I said, it was our only window to the world at the time. And um, our whole company basically pivoted around what we did on our video blog and um, how we informed everyone in, in our business, basically. Anyone else? Yeah, I can add something. I mean, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are aware there's this great video blogging themes as well. I mean, Mark has done a few at uh, his Obox company with a one-click install. You have a video blog set up, and you know, it's very easy from there just to upload your video blogs, whether it be Vimeo or YouTube, etc. And there are even plugins that you can use that we learned earlier today to install something like the Amazon Web Service, where you can host your video on you know the cloud and not put that pressure of streaming that high bandwidth uh, media on your own servers. You know, and all of that can be done with the WordPress backend and um, I think it plays again to the fact that uh, there's so many uses for the WordPress front end and video blogging is you know, definitely one of them. What would you say is the best platform uh, to host videos? So YouTube, Vimeo, etc. It depends. So, I mean, YouTube's great. I mean, they basically invented video sharing, you know, so I use YouTube a lot. Um, Vimeo is very cool as well. I mean, Vimeo has um, something called Vimeo Plus where you subscribe and then you can actually brand the player yourself with your own logo of your. So I have a site called Bandwidth Blog, and we do a lot of um, uh, um, interviews with entrepreneurs. And we interview the entrepreneurs, and then it's cool to embed the video obviously in the post on your site, and then have the Bandwidth Blog logo on the player itself. And when you right-click on the flash object, it doesn't say, you know, YouTube player. It's your own brand as well. So you have that cool element of being able to brand your own video player. And, you know, I've done it before. Coding your own video player is an absolute nightmare. And, you know, uploading um, videos, AVIs, and MPEGs, and compressing them and then streaming them onto various browsers is another nightmare as well. So you want the pros like YouTube or Vimeo, etc., to handle that. Um, and I think Vimeo Plus also ha doesn't have restrictions, so you can upload you know five or ten gig files without having to compress it yourself and just say like here Vimeo, deal with this and compress it yourself. You know, and, um, you know the, another cool thing about the big video sharing sites is if you log on with an iPad or whatever. I mean, it's all about cross-platform these days and you know, if someone logs onto the iPad onto your site, Vimeo or YouTube's gonna detect that and serve an HTML5 player instead of you know, a Flash one. We've built social networks before and we had our own video player and sometimes it wouldn't work on tablets and it was an absolute nightmare, so. Neil, you wanted to add something? Yeah. Uh, just from a publishing perspective, obviously YouTube has its virality um, where it will spread virally much easier than Vimeo. But what we found that uh, actually embedding Vimeo into our websites was better uh, just because it's got a better resolution, better quality. And analytics and so forth. And uh, so, so YouTube is better from getting it out there, but when it's on your website, Vimeo is, is the choice. Um, we've used anything from Zupi to Vimeo to Vidler and on YouTube. And um, in our experience, I'd say that, uh, well, a few years ago, Zupi was really great for local bandwidth uh, because lots of people had local only bandwidth. Um, YouTube was obviously is the leader like in terms of pure uh, pulling power. Um, Vimeo is the best looking one by far. In fact, all of our theme demos only have Vimeo videos on because they look so great. And then you also have Vidler, where, which is great for the community because they can comment on the timeline on Vidler and their comments will pop up as the, vid, uh, the video plays. So that was also quite a cool thing that we, we ran on our blog for a while to get people's input on our videos. Um, and proprietary players like 
like Charles said, making your own player, I don't think that's a good idea at all. Because have you, how, how often have you been watching a video where the video is buffered and you want to go back and watch something and then it has to rebuffer? Um, with slow internet, there's, there's just no way out of that and there's, there's no excuse. That all other players look fine and as Charles said, you can, with Vimeo, you can brand them if you want, so there's no excuse to using your own player unless you're a really clever person. <laughs> I've coded it really well. What is that service that upload once and does everywhere? Um, there's a service where you upload uh, once and then it like puts it everywhere. You know? Tube yes, Tube Mobile. Yeah. Um, if you use a service called Tube Mobile, you can actually upload to all the video sites all, all at once. So um, you don't actually have to go individually and upload the video on Vidla, Vimeo, YouTube, um, and whatever else. I mean, it's basically being on everything, it's like you want to be on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, and everything. It's exactly the same with video, you want to be on all platforms. You want the audience, a little piece of the audience on each platform, so using something like TubeMogul is definitely a brilliant idea, as I mentioned in the chat. All right, now we're gonna move on to photo blogging. Uh, Joe, you're quite uh, big, big into your photos. Um, why don't you tell us a bit about how it um, enhances your site strategy? Cool, so um, I recently did a photography exhibition and um, I went through the process of basically redoing my photo blog and it was it was interesting to see how, how it improved because I think about two, two to three years ago I put up a photo blog and it was quite primitive, the themes actually sucked a bit and there were all these sort of tool changes you had to install the back end to resize the photos and it's, it's nice to see how all those things just happen natively in the new WordPress sort of from version 3 onwards, you don't have to worry about all the resizing. Um, so that's been a quite cool experience. Um, and I think the themes are also, the big thing with photo blogging is it has to look good. So. And generally, in the past, you had to definitely buy a premium theme if you're going to be serious about photo blogging. But uh, in my recent experience, I just grabbed one, which um, I don't, don't remember the name of. It's called Graph Paper Press, something like that. Um, pretty slick, it's free, um, worked beautifully, had some good comments about it. And um, yeah, I've been very happy with the way it's progressed over the last two years. Um, with our. Uh, with our theme market and people buying our themes, we have so many photographers uh, using our themes, and we actually have a few photo themes that, that um, get sold on our site. And um, a big thing that we've found is that a lot of them want themes which um, don't distract from their, from their content, like they, they have really amazing photos. So if you're running a, a photo blogging site and it has um, an amazing background or Lots of business around your photo that kind of distracts from the from the content itself. So maybe a tip if you have a, a photo blog is just to, to use a more simple theme, one which lets the pictures speak for themselves and um, make them easily viewable, and especially allow for the correct um, aspect ratio of, of um, pictures because uh, you don't want them to be chopped off top and bottom, which is what some things do. Some other things can do that with the imagery size and scripts, so you just got to choose them wisely. Can photo blogging enhance a regular blog too? I think if you, are you saying changing it from a regular blog to a photo blog? You, having a regular blog, but yes. then having every so often photo uh, oh. blog posts. I think it depends on your user. If your user likes to read the newspaper or, or just a book without any pictures, then I think no. But if your user is the kind that likes to look at the picture and not read, then yes, of course. And Neil, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah I think photos definitely do help, um, just from an SEO perspective. If you're producing really good photos now and again, you put them onto your website. It doesn't have to be a photo specific, it could just be an image. But if it's a really good graph or really good stat, that could turn into someone else taking that image, putting it on their blog, and linking back to you saying well, this is the creator. So images, a very good like link bait tool as it were. No, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. However, if you are going to decide to sell things on your blog, it's probably a good idea to put a, a picture of um, humans on your blog because that, that'll increase people's, uh, how they associate with your product and um, bring more sales. Um, sort of doing our things. <laughs> like, Mm -hmm. All right, uh, 
Next, uh, we move on to uh, microblogging uh, or tum blogs. Um, what advantages does the tum blog format have over traditional blogging? Oh, I mean, rough question. Uh, you know, it's, tum blogs are normally associated to personal blogs. You know, someone doesn't have a lot of time to write thought-provoking long blog posts. He just wants to have like a, you know, he wants that length of blog in between a tweet and a blog post. You know, that where he can quickly whip out his phone and you know the Woo guys did a great. Um, Time blog iPhone application that you can quickly blog off your phone, like take a pic and then you know upload it to your own blog. And I think you guys have done a bunch of time blog themes as well. You yeah. Know, so. Well, we're, we're time blog themes, so you're not actually running. Um, so we, as Shaw was saying, we themes have a, an app which basically turns a, an app and a plugin, which basically turns your WordPress blog into a Tumblr blog, which makes it a lot easier to share your content. Um, and it's called Woo Time Blog. And the idea behind that is that when you're using a Tumblr, a Tumblr Tumblr, you're not actually in control or own any of your content that's owned by Tumblr. But if you're using the Woo Tumblr plugin for your WordPress site, you're still owning your own content, which I think is quite important. Um, I still have a t uh, two Tumblr blogs actually, and um, they are pretty cool for quickly sharing content. Um, you know, the user interface is really easy. And um, there's also a little community behind it, so you get you get visitors naturally from the, the Tumblr platform. I want to add one small thing. I mean, something happened with when Twitter started emerging. Everyone started uploading photos to Twitter, and you know, Twitter couldn't house your photos. So you started using TwitPig or Yfrog or you know, Tweet Photo, and sort of fragmented your photo sharing online. So you had some pics in Flickr, and then you had some pics on. You know, Twitpic as well. Now, what I found was quite cool with the Tumblr is that you could actually attach it to your own blog and then start <coughs> writing photos to your own blog and then automatically tweet that. Because you'd be surprised how much traffic you drive to Twitpic or Tweet Photo um, by tweeting your photos. You're driving massive page views for these for these publishers or these you know, services. And if you you know if you rather upload the photos to your own blog and then tweet it out and you know, share your pics, even like for the likes of Instagram, etc., you're driving this audience to your own blog all the time, and it's a much better. Um, you know, model to you know, grow audience on your own brand and host your own brand as well versus like fragmenting your photo uploading, having some pics on Instagram and then having some pics on your photo blog and then on Flickr and then on Twitter. Would you uh, suggest companies using Tumblr at all? Um, I mean, especially with something like you mentioned on Twitter. Uh, would you recommend that they using that or would you still go say go the traditional blog? Uh, you mean Tumblr blogs and stuff? Yeah. 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 You know, it's. It's, uh, for me, it's more of a personal thing, you know, writing up short little updates and sharing what you're doing right now. You know, I think there's various, I think it's quite a broad question, I think there's various uses for blogging and you know, Twittering as well. And I think you should do all of it in terms of your company, if it's relevant to your business. If you're a corporate business that sells financial services, maybe not. But if you're pushing like a particular product, like a software as a service product, then, then likely if your CEO wants to tweet or do tumble blogs, so they have, give that personal feel to a you know, company, then definitely. Right. Now, guest blogging. Um, what are your top tips for guest blogging? I'll jump in here. I mean, I have a blog network, so we have lots of guest bloggers that approach us all the time. And a lot of the time, it's a guy that wants to write an article and then drop a few links back to his site. It's a link building exercise. So, for yourself to write guest blogs and get it published on other people's blogs, classic old school strategy, you know, great for link building, fine. And if you're the blog owner or the publisher and receiving the guest blogs, <laughs> Now I would make sure it's relevant to the topic of you know your destination and make sure the content is unique as well. You don't want you know someone publishing the same guest blog on various blogs because it's too lazy to write unique content. And it's always a good idea to Google some of the sentences in the guest blog when he sent it to you to see if it's been indexed elsewhere. And uh, also, if you can have people guest blogging on your platform, it's a it's a good idea to make sure that they have a good following because I mean the idea of guest blogging is basically to drive traffic. I guess the idea of blogging for most people is to drive traffic towards yourself. So, um, if you can do so uh, using someone else's content, or if the person that you're using has a good following, then it can only do you good. Uh, just a quick SEO tip. Yeah, as as Shell said about link building, it's, it's excellent. But what you could do as well is obviously you also you got if you've got your own blog, you could take that story, put it on your own blog, and then reword it slightly, rehash it, and then publish it onto a contribution blog. Uh, obviously, every every blog is different. They might say, "Well, we want it on their blog first, and then you publish it on yours." But at least you're covering two birds with one stone, where you've got the same message but written differently. So it's staying on your own own blog, and it's going on a third-party website to get additional exposure. 
Now, uh, what would you consider as hooks that would make people want to return to your site or blog? Your number one tip to share with a new blogger. Which would be the last one? <laughs> your questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> maybe write controversial content. Because uh, if you have something which people can agree or disagree with and generate a conversation on your blog, then um, basically people will come back. When we had From the Couch, we had an amazing amount of people who used to comment on more of our controversial posts than anything else because they're like, oh wow, I can't believe they're saying that. I must say something. Oh, I must go back and check what other people are saying. Oh gosh, I like cats, not dogs. No, oh, dogs are the best. So maybe just put, just maybe just make your your site lol cats. My my thing would be you know find what the popular opinion is and then just disagree about it and just publish it you know? or or stir in the comments. We have, we have the manager of Sport24 in the corner there, and he's got like six, seven hundred thousand uniques a month, massive. And they'll, always, they'll write a story, and I'm sure it's their guys doing it. They have like the Springbok squad announcement, and the first comment will be like, bullshit, John Smith, why is he a hooker? And then everyone's like, rah! People come back all the time to like debate and, you know, sort of fight everyone else. So I think it's a great way to drive the business. Obviously, more complicated. I'd say that uh, sort of this is more the context of the personal blogging thing. I think it's. Um, it's interesting to sort of like write about sort of themes and sort of niches which people find interesting. So you find I used to be active in the ISP industry, so I used to write about things like open access and spectrum and all these sort of things. And you write sort of a, a theme of things, people start seeing you as sort of um, a, sort of a, a source of knowledge for an industry or a niche. And I think if you, if you can sort of um, crystallize that in their mind, that it's, it's topics which are relevant to the industry, I think they'll come back. Two things. Uh, internal linking. If you're writing a blog post, internal link. So you're getting those click-through rates. So people actually you exposing your blog post to, um, or you're exposing more blog posts to your reader. And the other, I actually noticed that on the Spatula uh, blog, we actually have on every blog post they have a subscribe now button. I think that's at the, the bottom. So once you've read it, the first call to action is subscribe now to the feed. And that's a great way to. You know, I completely agree. And a lot of your traffic is going to come from search engines. They're going to land on your article page, and then the visitor leaves. And a great way to try to make that visitor into a return visitor is have the like and the retweet, or you know, follow your site or like your site in the footer or maybe below the title of the article. You know, and have the RSS button there as well. If you like this post, you might like these posts as well. Type of thing to try to turn that anonymous search user into you know a subscriber of you know Twitter, or Facebook, or your RSS, whatever. You know, to try to turn it into a sticky user. And once you have them liked or followed, you're able to market other content to them and try to, you know, to, uh, you know make them as a return visitor. Now we're moving on to the importance of SEO. Um, keywords, how far do you target keyword based articles versus just passion blogging and publishing? Do you pay careful attention to targeting high volume or relevant keywords on your site? It's I think you have to be aware of both, um, but you need to be targeting the, the bigger uh, high search volumes. And generally what happens if you start targeting the, the, the high volume search volume, the high keyword search volumes, then the long tail looks after itself. So if you're going after the big keywords, you need to be internally linking, you're doing the on-site on optimization, uh, ensuring that you're getting the long tail, because the long tail is actually where you get most of your traffic. I mean, if we're talking just about personal blogging, you, you, you know, you're not going to be able to just write about content that are going to bring in, tra you know, keywords that are going to bring in lots of traffic that you're going to run out of steam, you know, so, you know, write about stuff that you're passionate about, you know, get the Google Analytics set up, see what your keywords are bringing visitors to your website and then just evolve on that, you know, if you see two or three search phrases that are bringing in traffic, use the tools that Rafik mentioned to find other related keywords to that niche and then write about that as well. Yeah, Google Webmaster Tools, you know, a bit of a mission to get it added to your site, you know. Okay, you can do the Google Analytics thing now, that hardly ever works, but a uh, great way to see where your search traffic is coming from and who's linking to you as well. You can use Google Trends to match, to see, uh, you know, related keywords to the keywords that you're already uh, using. Um, yeah, there's quite a few tools. And uh, how familiar are you with on-site SEO techniques? Uh, do you do analysis, analyses of your site? Uh, to check that it's being read op optimally uh, by search engines? Uh, do you pay careful attention to the use of keywords within the headers of your site? 
yeah, headers are important, but the thing is with SEO, if you stop analyzing too much, you just you don't get any work done. So there's a there's a happy medium between not analyzing too much and just writing uh, natural content and then doing the basic ones optimization. Don't focus too much on 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 SEO. Uh, make sure that you stay passionate to what you're doing, um, and the readers will come. Don't don't go too much into hardcore. SEO and analyzing every single portion of the website. It's just, it's counterproductive. Nothing. And uh, I just want to agree with what uh, Neil said. If you're going to write a post that's just purely based on SEO, um, you may get the, the readers, but uh, there's no way that they're going to return or even, um, or even sit there and read your article for five minutes because they, they'll lose interest and just leave. I was sitting there watching Odd Matthews mess up the national anthem. <laughs> And then I had my you know, iPad with me and I saw how crazy everyone was going on Twitter regarding it and I knew that um, they're going to search for it and they want to you know, see what happened. And we wrote a quick little post, embedded the YouTube video of him messing up the anthem, which is already on YouTube. And you know, we did a quick little meta description, SEO uh, plugin that says Odd Matthews National Anthem. Boom. I mean, within an hour we were ranked second. And because the search result page hasn't really been finalized yet because it's a new keyword, all the entries are bouncing around and the likes of Times Live or News 24 haven't picked up on it, which generally outrank you. So all the smaller, quicker, agile sites were ranking at the top. And I think within two days, we generated like 18,000 uniques. Um, and sure, the traffic isn't, it's not a lot of return visitors. And that's where it comes in, where you have the like and the follow stuff, so you can try to get those visitors, visitors to become return visits. But what it did for us is it exposed our sport blog, which is the smallest of our net, in our network of blogs, to 18,000 people that likely has never heard of sport blog before. And if you have, that's a cool brand awareness exercise as well. So if you see things that are happening in real life that you think people are going to be searching for, like write about it. You know, you know, if, and if you have SEO down to a certain extent, you're definitely going to drive search traffic from it. Cool. Um, I'm happy to learn that there's a, there's an opposite to SEO strategy. It's passion blogging. That's what I do. <laughs> um, internal linking. How important do you feel internal links uh, are in terms of your overall SEO strategy? Do you pay careful attention to the internal linking structure of your site? I mean, everyone knows deep linking is definitely one of the key factors of ranking really well. Um, you know, it's one of the things that Google's algorithm takes into consideration, and there's various plugins that do auto deep linking for you. So, I mean, I have people that write and often you have to go behind them after they've published their post and link the right keywords because as a writer and they're writing for passion, they don't really care that they need to link Lewis Hamilton to the highest ranking Lewis Hamilton page on your site, you know, for example, or, you know, Google to the Google tag page, for example. So, there are various tools that you can use and maybe you can give us your opinion in terms of what you think of auto deep linking, but there's a lot of tools that you can use to automatically deep link um, keywords in your um, article to category or tag pages that are on your site or to even pages that you specify as well. And this plugin I use, you can actually create a central database of all of the keywords and the links for the blog network and then whenever those phrases are mentioned across the network they're linked and so you, not only do you deep linking them, you do cross linking between your network as well and it's a great way to automate that task because it's quite time intensive to you know, link the keywords and you can limit it to only link two or three keywords per article so you don't do keyword stuffing and like every second sentence there's a bunch of keywords linked. Yeah, I might be controversial here, but say I, I don't really, uh, we've tried it and don't really enjoy it because what happens is once you build up a database, you, you, you target one keyword to go to one post, and then you create another post, but that post is continuously going to be sending traffic to one post and not the other. So there's an element, it's, it's a tool, and it's, it has its value, um, but yeah, as soon as you start building up more content and you want to link to different sort of articles over the same keyword, um, it has I completely agree, and this tool actually allows you to rotate. So if you have, for example, three Lewis Hamilton articles that you'd like to link to, it actually rotates between them. So it's a great way to do like cross-linking with various keywords. You know, it's on that. Uh, so it's, I think it's uh, it's a different Russian name to run. I think it's Smart Links, and it's the guy's Prelovac, P-R-E-L-O-V-A-C, or something like Vladimir Prelovac, or something like that. So I think it's called SEO Smart Links, and. I'm not sure if you're going to touch on images, but the same dude also does a plugin that'll actually, because I mean, on, on our site, car blog, we have like 5,000 images, and they're all like ds3009.jpg. And this plugin actually goes and renames all of the images based on the keywords in the title of the post, and then does the alt tag for the image for you as well. And 
we saw a massive jump in image search traffic when we installed this plugin. Um, and I know image search traffic is shit because it pops up and then the user never visits your site, but there's a line of JavaScript that you can put in that closes that pop-up and redirects the visitor to your site as well. And, um, you know, not the best converting traffic in terms of turning those users into subscribers or clicking on your AdSense ads, etc. But if you have a, a, a decent enough volume, a small percentage will, you know, you'll be able to monetize them or turn them into subscribers. So, and you can't discount image search traffic. So I think it's SEO friendly images and SEO smart links are the two plugins that I would use in conjunction, in conjunction with Yoast that you mentioned earlier. Like hopefully they play together, you know, who knows? Um, but yeah, I would definitely experiment with those. Now I'm going to move on to social media. Uh, quickly give us a quick history about how long have you been using social media on your site? Nice questions. Um, yeah, so I mean, since the social networks are around, I would imagine, you know, like there's only a few big social networks that you need to pay attention to. There are second tier social networks like the likes of StumbleUpon, etc. But when you get traffic from them, you'll see it's normally the visitor spends like 19 seconds on your page and then moves on, you know, which you can't really monetize those visitors. So um, I think driving social media traffic to your site is crucial. You know, if your site is mainly dependent on just search traffic and the likes of Google or Bing makes a tweak to their algorithm and your page fails, falls out of favor, falls out of the top five spots, it be a massive business risk if you suddenly start losing loads of search traffic. So you can build up other traffic streams, social media being one of them. It's you know, a much safer way to build your audience. And I have a great plugin that I use. It's called adthis.com. I know adthis used to be like crappy back in the day, but they've relaunched and it's really good now. And with one click, you can install, like retweet in Google+. Plus. And then there's a little more icon that you hit, and then all the other second and third tier social networks are there. And it takes it a step further where they have great analytics uh, for social sh sharing on your site as well. So as you study your Google Analytics, you can look at analytics, analytics around um, the sharing of your content as well. And if you have a client business which uses WordPress, um, you can provide in your weekly or monthly reports to your clients in terms of their analytics, you can provide social sharing analytics as well. And your clients will definitely appreciate that. And both analytics and Adlis have APIs. You can actually pull that stats into the dashboard of WordPress. And then you really start providing your clients with a sick CMS they can use to you know, run their site and also view their analytics and check out their social sharing as well. Um, I think with social media, it's, uh, you know, there are all kinds of social sites that are popping up every day. Um, and I think um, part of a social media strategy, if you're going to have one, is get there first and get your name because, you know, so often you're going to, it's just like if you're trying to get email and you have to put like an, a number after your name or dashes and, and hashes and all kinds of other characters, but it's nice to have um, just Mark Perrell, for example, or Charles has on Twitter, he's just got CN, which is pretty main, so um, you don't want people going in and stealing your name when new, new social networks pop up because you never know if you can utilize them to bring traffic to your site. Yeah, just on a, a Google Plus point, uh, Google hasn't brought out the business uh, Google Plus yet and they have said they are going to. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how that all gets put into place. In my mind, I think that they're going to start putting in sort of like a, a tweet sort of um, platform within Google Places. I would like that to be seen. So I think we need to focus on Google Places, um, getting our profiles set up uh, for uh, if something like that happens. Uh, but quite possibly, I think they're gonna, it's, it's going to be quite a big influence if, if that's the to go. We need to, we need to focus on Google Maps and you know, be ready for when Google Plus business gets, gets launched. I know Google Plus is like yet another social network, but I don't think it's something that you can ignore. I mean, Google's so massive, and they're integrating Google Plus everywhere. I mean, if your site page has loads of plus ones, they're going to, that's going to start affecting the search engine rankings for that keyword as well, and you know they'll start integrating that more as well. And I mean, with our network, it's some sometimes Google Plus in a day sends us more traffic than Facebook and Twitter does, you know, which is really interesting for us as well. So it might be the same traffic, the same person that's there and is clicking through as well, but it's just a another uh, platform you can use to distribute your content with. And let's face it, in terms of a media owner, that's all Twitter and Facebook is. It's a way for you to you know, get your content out there and get those fish, those visitors, and bring them into your, um, into your site. Um, in terms of owning a blog, I, I would definitely try to use all of the other social plugins that Facebook provides, like the like box and what your friends have shared on this site, you know, the Facebook plugins and the discussion widget from Twitter that shows what people are saying about your content on Twitter. It's just 
great things to pop into the sidebar of your site and populate the sidebar with nice dynamic content and it's all remotely hosted so there's no scaling issues there and those remotely so I would I would you know check out all of those um, social plugins um, there's there's one I'd like to mention or one, one little app which I found which is quite cool and it's a little Facebook um, app called RSS Graffiti which um, is pretty slick it's much better than Facebook's native sort of way of putting in blog content onto Facebook that's pretty cool um, so yeah, I only really use Facebook and Twitter. Uh, one of my blogs, um, very little Twitter, and pretty much only Facebook. And uh, I'd have to say that Twitter does a much better job at the moment of, of bringing in traffic. Um, people, maybe because it's sort of quite cryptic, people see it, see it, and they go and click on it. Um, whereas Facebook generally sort of shows up images and sort of a description, and maybe they sort of just scan it and move over. I've got some theories as to why, but. Now, Twitter is Twitter. Twitter is an awesome way of getting people to come back, and after they read something they liked, to, to follow. I think people quite quite easily follow um, people on, on, on blogs on Twitter. So I would definitely uh, suggest you use Twitter to get people to come back. One last thing, um, and if you're you know, that RSS graffiti you mentioned is a way to auto publish to your fan page your updates, and if you're auto publishing your content to Twitter and Facebook. It's cool to have your own Yule shortener as well. I mean, if you want to, you want it gives that element of branding to your site, you know. And Bitly Pro allows you to, you know, create your own Yule shortener, and then instead of showing a Bitly link in your tweet or on Facebook, it actually has a short abbreviation of your website's domain, you know. And it just adds that element of like proneness to your auto tweeting, and again, great analytics there as well. We you can log into the Bitly backend and check, uh, you know, what content people are clicking on and where they're coming from as well. Right, moving on to monetizing your blog. Um, advertising. Uh, what advertising do you use on your blog? Uh, okay, so I'll answer from blog network perspective. I mean, obviously everyone knows about AdSense, and AdSense is definitely still by far the best uh, advertising network. And they've acquired, I mean, ages ago, AdMob, and they're rolling AdMob into AdSense for mobile now as well. So in terms of your WordPress site and then your mobile version of your site, you can you know, pop ad, AdSense across both. And there's a local company called AdDynamo, founded by a mate of mine called Sean Riley, and everyone sort of laughed when he said he's going to take on AdSense, you know, and, you know, to a lesser extent, he's done really, really well. And I have AdDynamo on, um, you know, spots on my pages and I've made some decent money across the network with them and they've got a premium ad dynamo section as well where they push premium advertisers to you and anyone can go sit down with them and request to be a premium advertiser and you can make some decent money. Um, so, you know, it's definitely AdSense and AdMob and, but, you know, by far, obviously, private advertising is, um, is the best way to make, you know, 10 times the amount of money you can make with AdSense and, you know, currently, the likes of 24.com and IOL and Times Live take out like 90% of the private advertising out of the market because you know, they deal directly with the agencies, the ISO bars, accelerations, etc. But and that's because online advertising in South Africa, I think it's like 2% versus the total ad spend in the country. But in the States and in Europe, it's like 18% of advertising spend is digital. So we're lagging massively in South Africa. And once we start catching up, and we will, the smaller publishers will start making some private bucks as well. And you'll start getting the agencies, and we have it now as well, start approaching you and start booking campaigns where you make 20, 30K with a campaign where that'll take you six or, you know, six months to make with AdSense. You know? So in terms of monetizing your site, I would say like build audience now and you know, do all the SEO and social media and get that audience ready and create a nifty little two-page PDF rate card that has all your stats on it and your social media reach and the types of content that you're writing about and who your authors are, etc. Stick it up on your site and you'll find like in a year or two you'll start getting agencies contact you and booking that private display media advertising. You can start selling ads on a CPM basis instead of a pay-per-click basis. Um. I'd say that um, you know if you have a, a network like Charles and uh, um, Google Ads and, and all kinds of ad networks are really great to have on your on your blog because people don't mind it. But um, I know that when we did uh, from the couch and we are freelancers as well, we were we were quite against putting ads on because we thought that when people saw advertising on our personal blog that they would be they think we're just trying to get a cheap buck and they, they would leave. So. Um, you know, going against the idea of, of putting advertising on the blog, uh, you might as well advertise yourself and push your own skill set through a personal blog. And hopefully, I mean, if you want to make money, then um, trying to make people understand why you're good at what you do and punch yourself <coughs> instead of trying to go, I want to say, the quick route and get people to pay you for, to put stuff on your blog. Yeah, I can just add to that. Uh, I think if you, if you there's two arenas you could be playing. If you're a startup blogger, 
and you want to, you've got this dream of making money from your website. So I th personally, I think if, if you're not blogging every day, you're not going to be able to generate the content, generate the interest, be able to push that content out to the social medias and create value. So I think you have to be blogging on a daily basis to be able to see any value um, for people to advertise. I'd just like to add one thing. I think if you if you are thinking of doing advertising, you have to sort of um, do it all the way or not at all. So I think if you if you've got a blog with like sort of half baked advertising, I think you could lose some credibility, especially when you're writing um, about different brands. I think if you sort of um, blog and it's half full of ads, and you often do sort of sponsored or brand brand influence writing, it could influence how people see see what you're doing. So I think if you are going to do it, um, make sure you sort of do it all the way and make sure that it's seen as sort of a, a blog which is there to make money. I can quickly add regarding which ad spots I've made some decent money off across my network. Um, obviously the leaderboard and the three, 300 by 250 ad are the most popular ones. Uh, they always do well, the click through rates are decent, but we've made some decent money. Trying to balance, as Joe mentioned, not you know having your opening blurb and then an ad and then the rest of the story. I mean, like, not a good idea. Mad click through rates, definitely, but you'll likely lose your return visits. So it'll sort of cannibalize, you know, it'll have a reverse effect on your business. But We've placed ads uh, above the post title, a small 468 by 60 ad. Mm -hmm. That's worked really, really well, and it's great for targeting as well, because the title of the post is right there. And then below, in the footer of the article, we've got this author bar that you know, Mark set up for me, where we have like a text uh, Google ad and the next to it related posts. And they like sort of look similar. I mean, you can't make them look completely similar it's against Google's terms of service, but it's a great way to get good um, click through on the ads there, because the ad's quite related to the article. So either the user's gonna read the article and then click on the ad and make you some money, or it's gonna click on one of the related posts, generate another page view for you, you know, and obviously page views are the name of the game, and then hopefully in the next step, you know, click on an ad or follow you or like your page and, you know, get a, you become a return visitor. And a call to action. If you don't have a call to action on an ad, people aren't going to click on it. We've noticed uh, quite a big difference in click-through rates. If you just have a blatant ad and not really just advertising a brand versus an actual call to action. If you actually have a call to action on the banner, click-through rates are much Cool. Uh, banner blindness. Do you agree that consumers are becoming more conditioned to online advertising? And do you feel advertising has a significant role to play in monetizing websites and blogs in the future, or are other form of monetization taking the lead? Well, it goes back to what I just said. I think call to actions. Uh, if you hold control over the design, then you can able to have a call to action on that banner. That can that can help. Um, personally, I don't have too much experience in, in banner advertising. Um, I just want to say maybe personally. Um, Kind of have a if you can have banner or any kind of advertising on the site, make it uh, make it friendly so people don't think they're going to be clicking into a maybe like a, a Russian uh, spam spam ring where they they're going to lose all their data and get hacked. You know, try and make the the ads comfortable for people to click on because I I would never click on a banner if it looks like it's going to go to a dodgy location. I, I mean I have clicked on banners before if they if they look trustworthy. So you know maybe keep that in mind. My advice would be, <clears throat> what you normally do is you have your advertising and then if you don't have paid ads, you show your house banners, you know, banners promoting your mates or your barters or other sites in the, your network and what that definitely does is create that element of banner blindness. So I would avoid all house banners and if you don't have uh, paid advertising, a lot of the ad networks like DoubleClick, etc. allow you to slide close to the ad spot and actually it takes away the ad spot and the content moves up so and then when a paid ad appears again it slides down and the user would at that point would have been used to no ad there because it's been closed for a week or a few days and then the ad is there they notice it and it's a much better chance for them you know, to have a click through the rate so you can actually close the ad spots if there aren't any paying advertising. Um, what if any affiliating marketing do you utilize on your own blog? Uh, Product-based affiliate marketing like Amazon affiliates. Uh, what part does affiliate marketing uh, as a whole have on your monetizing strategy? Um, do you use uh, useful plugins, uh, tools for affiliate marketing with WordPress? I hate affiliate marketing. Sorry, this seems so written. Um, affiliate marketers get you know get that brand awareness on your site. Their banners sit there, and unless someone clicks through and actually buys their product you're not going to make any money. You know? And that's like various hoops people have to go through to get to the end point, the checkout process. So they get all of this you know, brand awareness and exposure on your site and you don't make any money until they, you know, 
pay as you earn until you've made their money, they give you a fraction. So if you're running an e-commerce store, you know, affiliate marketing, rock on, you know, but if you're a blogger, you know, in my experience, and we have some sites that do a few hundred thousand uniques, and in a South African sense, that's a decent audience, and we haven't made much money with affiliate marketing because the conversion rate is so low. So I believe affiliate marketing lends itself rather to, if you want to do affiliate marketing, is having a little niche landing page and then driving targeted visitors there by AdWords or whatever, and then, you know, having a conversion like that, but just sticking, you know, affiliate marketing stuff on your site and hoping people will click, click through, you know, it's, um, I don't think it's going to work so well. Um, something that Sport24 does quite well, I keep referring to them because they're doing cool stuff, is, you know, they, they'll have an article about John Smith, for example, and then halfway through they'll have a little link that says, you know, it literally breaks the story, that says buy John Smith's book right now, and it links out to Kalahari, and they're using the Kalahari's E-Trader affiliate plan, so that's quite nice when you're targeted to that extent, with users reading about John Smith, and you can click through a new window, go and buy the book. You know, I don't know much, how much money Tank and them are making off that, but if you want to do it, you can do it, you know, integrated into the content like that, I think that would be a good strategy, but in my opinion, I would stay away from affiliate marketing, unless you are the person that's setting up the affiliate system. Uh, yeah, um Having an affiliate program myself with our themes, we find that if we do it, he's the other side. I'm, I'm completely on the other side. You know. It drives a good amount of revenue to, to your company for um, for relatively, well, not even relatively nothing, for nothing, because you don't have to pay anyone until they send you the money. So, um, exactly, it's all about the money. So, um, they're basically sending you business for, for no return. So, um, I know for a fact that some people who run affiliate banners of ours on their site sometimes get a lot of uh, flack for it because people don't like to be sold to another company. They think it's uh, <coughs> think it's not um, not very good practice. But um, if you're going to be running an affiliate site, you might as well be shameless and have a site which is based solely on affiliate links. So, for example, in the WordPress community, you'll have um, there's a one of our affiliates called themecouponco.com. They, all they do the whole day is go looking for affiliate links and coupon, literally coupon codes that they can run through the affiliate links and have a whole list on their website and that's unashamedly an affiliate site. So um, I don't think it's really cool to have affiliate linking on your personal blog, but if you're gonna turn into a business, you might as well go the whole hog. It's kind of like what Joe said, you, you, know, you either advertise full force or don't do it all. It's the same thing with affiliate links. Um, how to, how, can you just, uh, if you want to maybe share a few tips on how to make money from being a content publisher, uh, like your, your preferred type of content, syndication and SEO? Um, yes. We just hunted ourselves, I said that already. <laughs> yeah, we, we personally don't uh, make money off advertising, but a few of our clients, we've just seen that it's about the, the content. If you're producing quality content, you're going to get the visitors, you're going to get the the traffic through the, the Facebooks and the, the Twitters. But if you're not producing quality content, um, you're not going to have much value on their website. And that's what it comes down to, in my opinion. Right. Uh, yeah. I think if you're a massive publishing house, content syndication is a great way to make money off the content that you've already sold to advertisers on your site. You know, 24 does that a lot, but they syndicate content out to uh, Vodafone Live or MTN Loaded, the mobile portals and stuff, you know, and you're selling the same content over again as well. Creates an element of duplicate content as well, which isn't cool, so, uh, no, I don't have much views on it, but content syndication is a great way to, you know, generate revenue. Just uh, quickly, last questions from me, uh, breaking away from these. So just basically, uh, well, what do you think the future of WordPress, uh, what the future of WordPress publishing is, and where do you see your site in the next two years from now? I think it's like triple the audience. You know. <laughs> um, I think WordPress will keep evolving, and that's why it's sort of you know, emerging as the best CMS, is that they release frequent updates all the time in terms of security and functionality, and they're so flexible. If you want to have a three-page website or have a massive e-commerce store, WordPress can do both, so it's evolved way past blogging. And I think your ability to combine all of the services that the WordPress ecosystem or community offer I think is the you know the future of WordPress publishing. Having WordPress and installing Yoast as your SEO plugin and using something like Voltpress to back up your site. Um, there's so many of these cool services that you can use. Using Opux Mobile to you know get mobile stuff on it. Like, you know, future is obviously mobile. Everyone's got a phone in their hand. And I saw I was in Kenya the other day and there was an $80 Android phone being sold. And 
So even the Africans are going to have smartphones with good browsers. So you need to be able to render your site on mobile. And I think as uh, WordPress and the market evolves, WordPress on mobile will become um, you know, one of the big, big segments of WordPress. <laughs> I think in the next two years we'll just uh, we'll see a lot more scalability of WordPress. I think slowly but surely companies are now using a thinking not WordPress only as a blogging uh, platform, but actually a, a static sort of brochure, but obviously much more scalable. Um, and that's that's the key. I think that's where where it's going to go. And I've also seen actually I've seen a premium theme being built with WYSIWYG editors on the actual design. So it's like drag and drop functionality with design. Uh, that still in infancy stage, but that's where really, oh, um, I say it's going. I'd say that um, you know just basically what Charles and Neil were saying that WordPress is such a flexible system that there's, there's literally no bounds. If you want to say, you know, people always say about the internet um, or any technology, like it only goes as high as you want to take it. So. WordPress, like Charles said, it's, it's still a really great blogging platform, but then in the same sense, it's still, as you saw today with, um, with Dan's speech, it's, it's still a great platform to have e-commerce or basically anything you want. So it's more of a framework these days than, than just a blogging platform. I think more and more frameworks will emerge. I mean, at the moment, with one click install, you can set up a real estate website or a, a, a store or a, a job board or I think something that WooThemes did is support press, where it turns WordPress into a support ticketing system. You know? So more of these frameworks will evolve and WordPress will start infiltrating more and more different markets that have a presence online with the ability to install this theme framework to extend WordPress to go way beyond blogging or website CMS, be able to cover like, all of these different markets. Um, so more on a sort of technical level, I think that um, a lot of WordPress's strengths are, are sort of challenges um, in the future. Because it used to be quite accessible, the sort of flexibility and accessibility is great. I mean, everybody, you can do, you can run your little Mickey Mouse blog and you can run New York Times. Um, but the sort of traditional lab stack, which is very sort of um, popular out there and there's lots of skills available for the likes of PHP, uh, is nice, but there's also a lot of criticism that this PHP um, is not the most secure environment at all, far from it. And I'm actually quite against services like Vault Press. It's sort of like, selling you this supposed feature, but it's like, why isn't it secure to start with? Um, so I think that WordPress is almost going to have to sort of um, move away from this middle ground. I think it's almost going to have to be sort of WordPress basic and WordPress pro, because a lot of people are going to want the object caching and the optimization and the sort of massive each per second uh, out of the box. And then a lot of people are just going to want the sort of very basic uh, Apache on my single little server. So, um, yeah, I think it's definitely going to have to be sort of a trend towards uh, those two different poles of, of what it's being used for. Cool. Have you got any questions? Raise your hand. Uh, Cross-platform publishing is obviously where we are right now. Um, and we've got Obox Mobile for that. How far are we away from getting Obox Tablet, for example, where you can take advantage of all the features on the tablets, which are now also like right on top of us? Um, you know, we believe that our themes look great in tablets, and um, we also think that the, the whole point of a tablet is to be able to do normal web surfing, where you know, while you're sitting and watching TV, you're just not having a bulky laptop sitting on your lap. Um, but it, having an optimized site for an iPad um, is not a bad idea. For example, WP Touch Pro have that option, but we still think that normal sites um, function perfectly normally, especially if they have full JavaScript support and it's basically like running Safari on your tablet. So there's no limit to um, to what the browsers can do, so there's no reason to limit what the, the user can do with that site. Yeah, I, com I completely agree, but how far away do you think we are from getting to the point, I mean, the, the tablets offer a lot more rich you know, browsing experience. So. I don't mean, maybe this is a question to ask the developing side of the room, I don't know, but how far away do you think WordPress is in accommodating that and in terms of you guys designing themes, is that something that's on your uh, horizons for you guys as well too? In addition to doing what can be displayed in the browsers, start uh, developing themes that can, you know, one click and you can install, say for example, a tablet theme that they can then empower your site to have the rich user experience that we're starting to see with these devices. 
Um, I think that at the moment the, the JavaScript libraries that are available to, um, for example, uh, like finger tracking and, and gesture tracking is not um, far advanced enough yet to completely change the experience. So at the end of the day, you're still going to have um, a web-like experience. So until the libraries are more up to date or until we come up with a better solution to gesture tracking, um, I don't think the experience is going to change change much more. He's totally lying. I mean, the Overbox tablet's coming. You just do the <laughs> announcement here for like two months. You know, it's me for it. That's okay. good. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Blog where you are accepting guest bloggers to blog on the site. Is it only an exchange between the owner of the blog and the guest blogger because they want traffic and you wanting content, or is it normally a paid? Yeah, so it depends. I get this all the time. You have these guys that mail you and they've got an article, but they just want to link two keywords in the article back to their site. You know, so. If you're a smaller blog, you're going to get some free content, and they want to link one or two keywords back to your um, back to their site. Um, if you have a you know a destination with a massive following, uh, most of the times you have, an, a, have a guy that's in a particular niche and he's writing the content and it's not linking anywhere. He just wants to be on the site and get his name associated to it. Because at the top or the bottom of the article, it says guest blog by X Y Z, and this is their company, etc. So it's a marketing exercise for them as well. So I think it um, I think it uh, uh, depends. There's this whole ecosystem that popped up a few years ago of paid, paid guest blogs, you know, where you can actually accept paid posts on your site and uh, links in it as well. You get paid for it. It wasn't big here; it was big in the states. But um, yeah, I think it really depends how big your blog is and how you can leverage it. If you have a massive destination, you can say no links, and the content has to be unique and quite picky. But if you have a smaller blog and you want that element of free content, my only advice would be to make it unique, uh, the content be unique. But if they, want it, if they want one link or two links in the content back to their site, then fine. Just make sure the link, the site that they're linking to is a nice website and not a dodgy website, because Google will you know, punish you if you're linking to you know, websites that are harmful. Okay, and that's probably sorry, I'll so South Africa oh, South Africa so I think I mean if you want to start making money off AdSense you need a hundred thousand visitors plus otherwise you might make like one or two thousand rand a month I mean, like you know if you get you know rowdy on a Saturday night you might blow that type of money you know so like if you want to make some proper money where you can like build a good business out of it you need 100,000 plus audience in any uh, niche. Um, in terms of accepting a guest blog and being able to be picky, like uh, 25, 30,000 visitors, I mean, it's, it's quite tough to say. It depends, you know, the authority that your blog commands. I think it's more of an authority thing. But if you want to know, like, how much money you need to be able to sit at home in your pajamas each day and just blog, how much audience you need, if you want to just be at home and blogging all the time and making good money, then 100,000 plus would be my opinion, which is quite tough to get in the South African market. I mean, there's three or four million internet users. You, you know, it's like three or four percent. You know, it's quite rough. But um, visitors are cool. I know unique's always a little bit less, and hopefully, if you have an engaging website that can generate three or four hundred thousand page views off that hundred thousand visitors, um, yeah, I think in the South African market, it's also quite difficult to hit those numbers because the market is so small. But uh, you know, the first blog that I had is called Carblog.coza, and um, we were for many years un unchallenged, although there were no other car blogs, and I think Scott popped up with his site and he's, he's done really, really well. Um, but what we did was we posted three times a day, five days a week for two years, and we reached 160,000 uniques. And we made decent money off that. I mean, Google's been sending us a cool check every month for a long time. And as they mentioned, like if you want to have, if you want to take it seriously, as with anything in life, like you need to, your post frequency needs to be high. You need to be publishing every day. I mean, look at TechCrunch; they put up like 20 stories a day. And like it's all about writing good, unique content, you know, all the time. So, one more question, if anyone has. No? Cool. Boom. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us here today.